Well, I guess we can start now. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, also Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, this is January, and we are entitled to do that. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar organized uh, by uh, Iris today. I'm Barthélemy Courmont. I'm a professor at the Catholic University in Lille and also a uh, senior research fellow here with uh, Iris. Uh, we have today uh, a webinar uh, aimed at uh, understanding the relation between Japan and China and, of course, the uh, um, well, possibilities for France to be some sort of uh, uh, other player uh, in this dialogue. So the uh, title of this presentation is Japan, China, and France relations, two points, inviance, deterioration, and renewal. Uh, it is a very uh, uh, hot topic, especially when it comes to uh, the recent announcements uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the defense policy of uh, Japan made by uh, the prime minister, but also the reopening of China uh, after the end of the uh, so-called zero COVID uh, strategy. And, and I do believe that uh, on top of the uh, uh, variance and invariance in this relation. There are also some perhaps new factors and new elements uh, added to our reflection. We have today four panelists, uh, four distinguished panelists, and we are very glad to have them uh, expressing their, their opinions and views as regards this relation. First of all, uh, from Tokyo uh, is with us uh, today or tonight. Uh, and thank you very much for, for being here around the 10 uh, p.m. for you now. Uh, Professor Takahara uh, Akio, a professor at uh, Tokyo uh, University, you will be actually our first uh, panelist in, uh, in a second now. Uh, on my left, uh, uh, Camille Brugier, uh, you are Associate Research Fellow at the Institute for Strategic Research, uh, mostly known in France as IRSEM. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us, and you will be the second one uh, in this panel. On my right is uh, Emmanuel Laco, uh, who is a, a professor at the Catholic University in Paris, and also associate research fellow with, uh, with IRIS. Uh, Emmanuel has uh, recently published a, a book entitled Chine uh, et Terre d'Islam, Un millénaire de géopolitique uh, with uh, PUF. So thank you very much for joining us. And I believe that uh, on top of uh, the, this, this topic in, in your book, you will be addressing uh, Chinese uh, policy and Chinese relation with uh, Japan. And uh, the last uh, speaker will be Alice Ekman. Alice is uh, with us online. Thank you very much, uh, Alice, for joining us. Uh, Alice Ekman is a senior analyst in charge of Asia at the European Union Institute for Security Studies, the EU uh, YSS, uh, ISS, sorry. And uh, you have also recently published a, a very interesting book uh, entitled uh, Dernier Vol pour Pékin uh, with the uh, Edition de l'Observatoire. Uh, and I believe also that Alice will be addressing uh, the, the current uh, developments in, in China, uh, especially in relation with, uh, with Japan. Um, there will be um, about 12 minutes for each speakers, so I uh, invite you to respect this uh, framework, so we will have a sufficient period of time for the uh, Q&A session. Uh, as regards the Q&A, for all our participants online, you have a little icon called Q&A. If you have any question, and you can start uh, asking questions during uh, the presentations, uh, feel free to write down your questions. I will be collecting them and I will be uh, asking the questions to all our participants once uh, the presentations are over. Um, so uh, do not waste time, and I can start collecting uh, these questions as soon as possible. Uh, Professor Takahara, uh, I give you the floor now for approximately 12 minutes. All right, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. It's so exciting, and uh, it's such a pleasure and honor to be on this panel. Um, Thank you so much for the kind invitation once again. Now, um, the topic of Japan-China relations, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the issues involved, uh, but I think you know that the situation uh, currently is not quite ideal. Uh, according to the latest public uh, survey results, 87% of the Japanese do not have a good image of China and 63% of the Chinese do not have a good image of uh, Japan. Uh, but very interesting, you know, you, many of you may think that Japan and China are always fighting with each other, always bickering, uh, quarreling, but that's not necessarily the case. 
uh, we find in the same survey that in both countries, over 70% of the people find Japan-China relations important. And therefore, as far as the Japanese uh, political leaders are concerned, they have to address two different requests from the people. That is, on the one side, you have to stand firm against the physical challenges uh, that come from China. You have to, we have to be doing well in defending the Senkaku Islands, for example, and try to meet the military, uh, the strategic challenges coming from uh, the west side of our country. But at the same time, each prime minister has to try and improve Japan-China rela relations at the same time. Uh, so uh, that has been the standard um, uh, policies of the Japanese administrations for a long time. However, in the past two administrations, that is uh, the Suga uh, Prime Minister um, administration, and now it's Prime Minister Kishida who, had, who has just made a very uh, good visit to France. Um, in, we have had a rather uh, lopsided um, approach that is emphasizing the security side of things. Uh, and they haven't had a lot of initiative on the economic cooperation side, side of things. But why is that? Uh, it's because I think an increasing uh, pressure from uh, China is felt by a lot of the Japanese people. And on top of that, most recently, of course, there has been the uh, invasion by Russia into U Ukraine. And, you know, uh, last year there were a number of joint drills, joint um, military activities between the Chinese and the Russian military. And uh, you know what happened when uh, Ms. Pelosi visited Taiwan uh, in uh, retaliation, the Chinese did a missile drill and some of the missiles landed uh, in the uh, exclusive economic zones of, of Japan. Uh, and all these have contributed to the very tough stance that uh, the Japanese um, government has been uh, taking taking uh, recently uh, towards um, China. But China remains to be a very, very important economic uh, partner uh, for Japan. You know how big our trade with China is? You know, uh, the second, of course, China is the largest trading partner. The second largest trading partner for Japan is the United States. The third largest trading partner is the EU. And if you add our trade um, uh, total uh, of, uh, you know, putting our trade with the US and with the EU together, it's just above the trade amount that we do with China. So you understand the importance uh, of uh, China as an economic partner to Japan. Um, so usually uh, economy or economic interests play as a positive factor in promoting Japan-China relations, whereas security uh, usually plays uh, its role as a negative factor uh, in Japan-China relations. And um, most recently, people's perceptions have been declining, especially on the part of Japan, uh, because of the rising concern about uh, security uh, questions. And therefore, I think you are aware that um, uh, Prime Minister Kishida's cabinet has just announced uh, three new documents relating to our security policies. Uh, so, you know, Japan is now in a process, in the process to uh, transform uh, the traditional or the conventional uh, security policies that we have been taking in the past um, decades. Uh, there are other threats too. Of course, North Korea uh, is, is one, um, but China looms larger, especially with the rising might of uh, China. It's not only the increasing amount of defense spending and uh, the rising military capabilities, but also the fact that the Chinese have been um, acting, especially their, uh, their maritime advancement and their salami slicing in the East China Sea and the South China Sea uh, has had a big impact on the way we perceive the uh, military threat that comes from uh, China. So I always tell my Chinese friends 
that if you really want to stabilize and improve Japan-China relations, you have to stop sending your Coast Guard vessels to the vicinity of the Senkaku Islands. Because according to the public survey that I mentioned, the largest reason why the Japanese don't have a favorable view of China is because uh, of those vessels and aircraft that um, come to the Sen Senkakus. But actually when those uh, Coast Guard vessels and um, drones come, it's not only the Coast Guards, but also always the Navy, the Chinese Navy is offshore, you know, uh, behind those uh, Coast Guard vessels. So you understand uh, under this pressure, um, it's it's rather natural for the Japanese people to be um, very concerned about uh, uh, Chinese future actions, and we want the government to stand firm uh, against that. But as as I was saying, at the same time, we have to try and find ways to coexist and cooperate with China. Uh, so very difficult, but still we are trying. Um, for example, uh, the free and open in the Pacific, uh, which can be another important and interesting topic to discuss to, today, um, there are two aspects of FOIP. Uh, as uh, just just in the way that the Belt and Road Initiative has two aspects, right? One is the strategic aspect, one is the security aspect, and the other is the economic aspect. Uh, so. Um, if we focus on the strategic side of things, there's no way we can cooperate. There's no way uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Free and Open in, in the Pacific can coexist. But if we focus on the economic cooperation side of things, uh, we can do things together. So if you remember, uh, five, six years ago in 2017, then Prime Minister Mr. Shinzo Abe said it very clearly that if certain conditions are met, like the project's openness and transparency, economic viability, and the fiscal soundness of the recipient nation, if these four conditions are met, then the Japanese are willing to cooperate with the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and the Chinese understands the difference between the Japanese emphasis on the economic side of the free and open in the Pacific and the American emphasis on the, the strategic side of uh, the free and open in, in the Pacific. Um, so uh, our hidden agenda, as it were, uh, in, in the future, if Xi Jinping will be able to come to Japan, make an official visit, uh, then we would like to, we would like him to say, uh, you know, we would like to him to reciprocate what Abe said uh, six years ago and and say that the Chinese uh, can and uh, they are willing to cooperate with the Japanese version of the free and open in, in the Pacific. They can put some conditions like uh, in the way that Abe uh, put conditions, but um, uh, that's one thing that we've been aiming. And it's important to look for our joint projects. You know, uh, I liken the Belt and Road Initiative to a constellation. Um, you know, I don't think anybody has seen an actual constellation uh, because constellations don't exist, right? They are just concepts. They're only images that exist in, in your brains. Uh, and what's real, what's tangible are the stars, aren't they? Uh, meaning projects. Uh, so if the project, if the star is a good one, uh, meets the four conditions that I mentioned, then we can cooperate. So we should look for stars uh, that we can do uh, together. And they can say it's part of the BRI constellation. We can say it's part of the POIP con constellation. Uh, and, and that would be perfectly fine for bo both sides. But under the current situation, uh, those um, conversations of that uh, nature or that content is not possible because of this enormous pressure that we are, are feeling at, at the moment that, that was exacerbated by Putin's invasion of Ukraine and the joint military activities, as I said, uh, that the Chinese and the Russians have been uh, doing. So in this context, um, as Mr. Kishida was doing, uh, we find it very important to talk to uh, our European friends. You know, of course, it's important for us to reinforce our security alliance with the United States. Uh, that's uh, we feel we have to do. There's no choice. But at the same time, we would like to um, reinforce our uh, bondage, our relations with the, um, the alliance partners. 
uh, of the United States, including Australia, including South Korea, including the NATO uh, con countries. Um, so, so that's a large context. But the difficulty in uh, doing two things at the same time, uh, competition and cooperation at the same time, uh, it's been always difficult. But I think increasingly uh, the difficulty, the level will rise. Why? because competition is going to intensify on the one side. But on the other hand, cooperation, uh, especially in the economic field, but not only that, uh, in terms of environmental uh, protection uh, or um, you know, uh, anti-piracy, et cetera. We've been doing these things. And uh, especially on the economic front, uh, cooperation will deepen and widen uh, despite the competition for you know, high tech that uh, we are all uh, aware of. Uh, so the leader has to have a very solid power base to persuade both sides, the hawks and the doves, and go the middle way. But uh, that's going to be increasingly uh, difficult. Thank you. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Takahara. First, for respecting the, the 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 timeline. I mean, this is exactly a 12 minutes. Thank you so much for respecting that, and also for giving us some uh, very honest comments about the uh, the problems uh, in the relation between China and, and Japan. And uh, I start collecting a few questions actually as regards the possibilities to go beyond and to find some uh, possibilities to increase uh, the dialogue and the cooperation, but also for being a little bit more optimistic about the feasibility uh, of this cooperation. And I, I particularly appreciated your comments on the uh, uh, possible convergence, if there's any convergence between the BRI and uh, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. So that would be uh, uh, very interesting to, to uh, receive some questions and to comment on that. Uh, I will now give the floor to Camille Brugier. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, I assume that you will be uh, focusing a little bit more on, on China and how the Chinese uh, perceive this relation with Japan. I leave you the floor now for 12 minutes. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you for having me here today. So what I'm going to talk about is really uh, China's relationship with Japan on the one hand and with France on the other. And I'm going to talk a tiny bit at the end about how um, China perceives the increased cooperation in terms of security between uh, Japan and France that has been very recently announced. So uh, Japan and France, when it comes to China, they're very different actors. On the one hand, we have Japan, which is China's neighbor, and with whom uh, China has had a troubled past. Well, who, what actor hasn't had a troubled past with its neighbor? But that's the case between uh, China and Japan. On the other hand, uh, France with China, it is very far away. It is a member of the EU. It is a member of NATO. And these three actors are increasingly present and interacting in the Indo-Pacific. So what I would like to argue is that generally, uh, China is structurally less worried about France than it is about Japan, especially when Japan increases its cooperation with the United States. And I would say, however, that in the near future, China is probably not going to do much about its relationship with Japan. It's going to continue as it is. However, it is going to try and better its relationship with France, uh, notably because of its role it has in the EU. So first about Japan. So for China, as I have said, it is a neighbor with whom they've had a troubled past and also a troubled recent relationship. Um, they so that makes the relationship special it also makes this relationship particularly sensitive to turmoil and in the case of japan and china turmoil can come from many fronts it can come from the senkaku islands it can come from cross-strait relations between japan and taiwan it can come uh, from trade also because japan is very close in following u.s sanctions for instance so there are many, many fronts on which turmoil can arise between uh, Japan and China. However, as it has been said previously, uh, Japan and China, because of their geographical proximity, also enjoy an increased trade, especially uh, on the part of China outwards export towards Japan today. And it has been said before, 
China is the first exporter to Japan. It's the first economic relationship that Japan has with uh, an external power. And so as a Japanese commentator has said, uh, this relationship can best be characterized as hot economics and cold, cold politics. I think that this can still apply today. When it comes to France, uh, China considers it to be an important actor, but mostly because of its position in the EU. Uh, as most of you know, President Macron is expected to be in China in April, and this is uh, rare enough to, to be considered. Uh, in the context of American uh, trade restrictions on high-tech products, China more than ever needs the European market to make its manufacturing complex work. Uh, in 2015, as most of you know, uh, China issued a manufacturing policy that is called Made in China 2025. A lot of things have been said about this policy and the objective of the policy, the wish on the Chinese side, is uh, to make uh, China be able to rely on indigenous technology for its manufacturing complex. Indigenous technology is when uh, the technology you use to produce things uh, is owned by yourself, meaning that you own the intellectual property of these products. Uh, today, unlike the objective, China is heavily reliant on developed economy for the high-tech products it uses in its manufacturing complex. And so since the Americans are very much starting to reduce uh, the trade it has with China on these products, China is heavily reliant, increasingly reliant on developed economies and specifically the European Union uh, for these pr products. The second thing and the second reason why we can expect a better relation with France and with the EU in general in the near future is that China is currently experiencing a major economic slowdown. Uh, as the recent numbers have shown, uh, China's GDP for 2023 is very near uh, 3%. It's at its all time low in the last 30 years. And as some of you know, uh, the party's legitimacy, the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy is highly correlated with uh, China's economic well-being in the sense that China's promise is that it will uh, heighten the economic well-being uh, from one generation to the next. When you have very, very high growth uh, numbers, that's not a problem. It's something that is very easy to do. But when you're starting to have uh, growth uh, numbers that look very much like those of developed economies, it's becoming increasingly uh, difficult uh, to be legitimate at home. And so one of the things that is specific about uh, China's economy is that it is strongly driven by exports. So today, China has a huge trade surplus. It has been, especially in 2021 and 2022, uh, drowning uh, export markets with its products. And this has been able to keep it afloat. And so today, China is really going to try to keep good relations with these nations where it exports a lot of things. And so I would say uh, the United States, Japan, of course, but also and more specifically the EU. So this wish to better relations uh, can be seen through uh, China's recent meeting with Schultz. Uh, there, is, there was also a meeting with Charles Michel, uh, and there is an expected visit with Emmanuel Macron, as we've talked about. But we can also say that, for example, the nomination of Tsing Gong, uh, the uh, prior uh, ambassador to the United States, uh, as the future Chinese foreign minister is also a sign uh, that China is going to be more engaging with the EU and specifically also with France. This also can be seen with the demotion of Zhao Lijian uh, that we have seen is used to be uh, the spokesperson, is still today the spokesperson of the foreign ministry of China that was really, really strongly against uh, the West in general. He has been demoted. And so this also shows that there is really a change uh, on, on this front. Uh, 
So to wrap up, I'm not going to go into many details and we need some time uh, to, to discuss later on. Uh, to wrap up, I would say uh, that individually, uh, China is not necessarily going to do anything about the Japan-China relationship so far, except, of course, try and continue to have these good trade relationships, because it also needs it. It needs Japan as an export market, as we've said before. Um, it is not, however, going to take any significant steps uh, to better that relationship. However, uh, China is going to take these significant steps to have a better relationship with EU countries in general, from in particular. And to finish, I would say that um, uh, it does not perceive France uh, to be a major actor in the Indo-Pacific. We can uh, come back to that uh, a bit later. And so the increased cooperation between France and Japan on the security front is probably perceived in China as something to watch, but not necessarily something to worry too much about. Well, thank you very much, uh, Camille. It's exactly 12 minutes, so we are we are right in time. Uh, thank you also for sharing uh, uh, your approach of uh, the importance of France uh, for both uh, China and Japan, which is something that uh, will probably uh, get many questions about, like how to develop this uh, relation and how to uh, ampl uh, amplify the specificity of, uh, of France and, and notably the French uh, Indo-Pacific strategy uh, as regards the, the relation with these two countries. You have also um, made this a little perspective about uh, the, the future or the future trends, the possibilities of uh, future partnerships or at least a better dialogue between uh, Japan and China based on the current situation in China and the current needs uh, of China. So I, I believe that we will also get a lot of questions uh, as regards the, the, the possibilities. And it does echo also uh, Professor Takahara uh, comments, uh, which were more, let's say, positive about the possibility for a better dialogue between the two countries. Uh, now, uh, I will leave the floor to uh, Emmanuel Lanco. Uh, and I believe that Emmanuel, you will also give us some comments about the uh, uh, Chinese uh, current situation and how the Chinese uh, regard uh, perhaps more deeply uh, the relation and the perception of uh, uh, Japan. You have 12 minutes. Thank you very much, dear Barthelemy. Thank you, my colleagues, uh, to, for sharing the time with you. I will certainly echo a few points and I will repeat uh, certainly a few uh, facts uh, which have already been uh, commented by my previous colleagues. Uh, I will say that uh, to start with uh, the Japan and China relationships, uh, these relationships are really marked by a double dispute the first concerning the events of the Second World War and its heritage, and the second by island uh, rivalries. And to this is added the question of the values, uh, democracy and freedom of navigation for Japan, dictatorship and revisionist position for China. And the image of China has been dramatically and negatively changed. And the Chinese violation, both of Japan's sovereignty and Taiwan's uh, as well, have aggravated the feeling of fear concerning China. Especially, I think, uh, since uh, last uh, September in Samarkand, in Uzbekistan, uh, when Xi Jinping has uh, emphasized and supported Vladimir Putin in establishing a new uh, political world order. Uh, to this is added the threat of North Korea and the obvious support of Beijing towards Pyongyang. Uh, so to summarize the situation, Japan has entered an era of geopolitical, with geopolitical anxiety, and Tokyo has to face at the same time contradictions such as managing its economic dependence on rare earths with China. In that context, the Indo-Pacific project of which Japan is one of the main inspirations offers the opportunity to open up 
its own economic interest in different geographic areas, such as Africa and the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, Tokyo calls for its wishes, could be a path of collaboration with France, especially in the area of the Strait of Mozambique, uh, so the northwest part of Madagascar. This collaboration is variable uh, geometry in the field of military cooperation, in particular, uh, as mentioned by Prime Minister Fumio Kishida when he came to visit President Emmanuel Macron this month. The security dimension of the Indo-Pacific project is commonly shared by the two sides and gives more leg legitimacy of, of France in the aim to defend its interest in the overseas and to speak on behalf of Europe in a crucial region of the world, I mean the Pacific Ocean. Paris is also deeply concerned by the freedom of navigation and a more extensive cooperation could be planned between Japan and France for creating, for, for example, uh, a military base and why not in New Caledonia? It is uh, maybe an idea, uh, maybe we could have a talk about it. And uh, I will uh, answer to, to your questions uh, in the second panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. As a matter of fact, I have already received some questions as regarding the uh, uh, military cooperation uh, between France and Japan in the South China Sea and also in the South Pacific. So I believe that you will have the opportunity to uh, take the floor again to answer some of these uh, comments. Um, and uh, also, thank you very much for uh, reminding us uh, the importance of uh, the historical uh, factor when it comes to the negative perception, uh, which is reciprocal uh, in the case of China and, and Japan, and which creates lots of difficulties and which invites us also to consider this rivalry, as we most uh, often call it, uh, from a, a, a broad perspective. And, and that includes, of course, uh, the uh, legacy of World War II and the legacy of uh, this uh, uh, trauma between these uh, these two countries. Uh, our last speaker will be uh, Alice Ekman. So Alice is online with us. Thank you very much for waiting uh, for so long. I, I give you the floor now. I believe that you have lots of comments to add to, to what has been said so far. And uh, just uh, as a quick reminder for all of you uh, here, we have now at this exact moment, 151 participants online. So just to let you know that uh, there are many people uh, listening to your comments and I think it's, uh, it's a little reward. So Alice, I give you the floor now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Barthélemy. Uh, indeed, I would like to share three comments uh, following a very interesting presentation from uh, my, my colleagues. Um, the first one, I mean, is to nuance the first assumption that uh, China is uh, turning the page of the world for your diplomacy. Actually, none of you or the colleagues made it uh, made that assumption, but that's what we hear quite a lot uh, in recent days. Um, and Camille, you, you refer to uh, you know, change of position, nomination within the MFA, within the diplomatic apparatus. You mentioned Zhao Litian, uh, you know, spokesperson of the MFA. He's one of the spokesperson, but other spokesperson were also staff too. And I'm thinking about Hua Chunyin, who is still in, in position among others. So um, this to say that, uh, yes, China is... Uh, is really engaged in a new seduction uh, push towards Europe, as pretty obvious in recent weeks, uh, for various reasons that we can part that are partly economical, partly political. But to me, this uh, seduction push is rather superficial. Um, first, because the world warrior, uh, at least communication, is still very much going on. If you look at recent communication of uh, some uh, Chinese diplomats uh, pointing at uh, perceived mistake made by the French press, for instance, or the fact that uh, according to some official communication in Beijing, uh, COVID, uh, the, the 
current variant is is coming from us or from Westerners, and that China is uh, is acting very well in this present context, and the mistake is 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 Western. Uh, so you, we always have find this antagonism uh, whenever there is crisis to explain. But most of all, I believe this. Uh, Rapprochement, or this attempt of rapprochement is superficial, but because when it comes to Ukraine, <laughs> views are so diverging that uh, it's very hard to move on to other a topic of cooperation, or not a cooperation, but other you know, uh, topic to discuss. Uh, just because you know, on the Chinese side, there is uh, still uh, uh, more than reluctance, re uh, rejection to to mention the world war. Uh, it's a crisis in, in Ukraine. There is no war, and and uh, it still seems, according to official rhetoric, that uh, the faults are shared. That uh, that uh, Russia has been pushed by uh, the so-called fourth wave of uh, NATO's extension towards the east, and and the U.S. provocation. Of course, that's not my position, but I'm summarizing here as the official position of uh, China that is still very much in place, and also the fact that. Uh, as many of you have noticed, um, energy cooperation and generally also economic cooperation between China and Russia has consolidated in uh, recent uh, months. Uh, and China, Russia being the top uh, oil provider of uh, China, and also both countries continue to uh, conduct joint military exercise. Uh, so, I mean, divergences are so deep at time of uh, war um, and uh, the Ukraine uh, war is so important for Europe that it's hard to put it on the side uh, to consider a cooperation on China, even if China has very strong diverging views on this issue. Um, so I don't think we are witnessing a, a, a shift away from the world for your diplomacy, not a, no a rapprochement uh, between China and the EU in the future, even if it seems so uh, superficially. The second assumption I, I wanted to slightly nuance, um, but of course we have to remain modest in, in this time because it's, you know, it's very hard to analyze uh, um, China's uh, decision being on COVID, for instance, many of us were unable to anticipate uh, the lift of the zero COVID policy and the partial reopening of China recently. Uh, but I would like to go back to an assumption that we hear a lot and that we heard uh, previously, with, it was interesting to, to state, it is the fact that economy play uh, an important positive uh, factor in cooperation, in part, in part in cooperation between Japan and China or between China and Europe or China and France. And that we can still, to some extent, you know, uh, separate economic cooperation from uh, political, uh, you know, divergences, or at least we can still maintain a form of economic cooperation at a time of political divergences. Uh, first, th this kind of separation has shown its limits, limits uh, before, um, including on, on Xinjiang, as you know, uh, when uh, um, uh, you know uh, when when and the EU uh, adopted a sanction on Xinjiang, uh, an official who took part in uh, uh, decision making process in Xinjiang, the Ch I mean, Chinese side retaliated very quickly, uh, sanctioning uh, several uh, EU institutions and member of parliament. And this sanction, uh, tit for that sanction, is still in place and led to uh, to uh, Kai comprehensive agreement on investment uh, not uh, being adopted because, of course, the European Parliament uh, is reluctant to uh, to uh, to consider such adoption at a time where several of its members are still under sanction from the Chinese government. But so this is one of the many examples that have shown that uh, differentiation between economic uh, cooperation and political. Uh, uh, issues is is hard to to maintain because also because on the side of China they are intertwined right <laughs> um, so um, they are intertwined and more, most of all I I really believe when I read uh, Xi Jinping's speech being uh, at the opening of uh, of the 20th Party Congress uh, uh, three months ago or being uh, during the centenary of the uh, uh, CPC. Um, more than a year ago, that uh, economic development is important, but it's not the very top priority of the CPC. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not important. Uh, economic development is important, but it's not the top priority. And uh, and the assumption from the Chinese side is to say that political stability is a prerequisite for economic development in any case. 
sure, on our side, we can consider that uh, economic growth is the main source of legitimacy of the CPC, but also it's not the only one. Uh, being able to uh, to position yourself, I mean, position China at the same level of uh, the US or uh, also anti-Western discourse is also a source of legitimacy of the CPC uh, uh, today. So um, in that case, I don't believe that uh, le commerce adoucit les mœurs, as Montesquieu said, that uh, you know that uh, trade is is have a, have a smoothing has a positive effect on uh, on political relation in the end, especially at the time when everyone is talking about uh, everyone is talking about considering uh, reinforcing uh, strategic autonomy, uh, being less dependent on a foreign market, especially on on a market of countries who don't share same values and political system. And all the discussion and consideration we have here in Europe is also existing in China uh, from different angle, as can be mentioned also. But uh, you know that China has uh, launched a, a plan called 10,000 Little Giants, who is supposed to make China less dependent on some foreign companies, including European companies, who are part of the um, manufacturing Factoring uh, chain, including you know uh, um, companies such as uh, ASML from Netherlands, who, pro who are part of the uh, semiconductor production chain. So China has been more aware than ever, not just because of tech and trade sanctions coming in the US, but also because of the pandemic crisis and the shortage that has led to uh, that it has led to. China is more aware than ever that it has it's still very dependent on some uh, foreign technologies and product. It's very it's very much time to limit this dependency. So in that context, I think in the longer term, we have to uh, nuance a bit the fact that economics plays an important positive factor, because I think in the short and medium term, China is ready to pay the economic price of a stronger uh, autonomy in some sectors in, in the future. And in any case, some issues, including human rights issues, uh, including Xinjiang, including Hong Kong, are not negotiable anyway. And China is ready to pay the price of its political position. Uh, it has shown that in recent years. And the last, third and last assumption I would like to nuance a bit is one that has been mentioned about the, but maybe I, I misunderstood it. And I think uh, Professor Takahara, you also nuanced it yourself when you presented it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's about the fact that China can be both part of uh, Indo-Pacific and Belt and Road constellation. As uh, you know, and many of you know, it's, it's very hard. It will become harder and harder. Just looking at the reaction of, uh, of the Chinese government after the uh, release of a new security strategy of Japan, it's a very harsh reaction, as, as you have seen. Uh, China also uh, reacted very harshly to the, you know, to just the, what we can call the general uh, revival of the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific constellation or the development and promotion of Indo-Pacific strategies across the world. Uh, China has, uh, in May 2022, in last May, uh, Wang Yi had uh, had uh, uh, called. I mean, has has underlined that according to him, the U.S. Uh, Indo-Pacific strategy is uh, illegitimate and doomed to fail. <laughs> And uh, it considered that any uh, move toward that direction is a provocation uh, towards China. So. Um, Japan clearly is uh, also, uh, you know, promoting a seduction, a push towards Europe, also clear security rapprochement, which is a traditional allies in the US. Um, Japan is, is uh, you know, is, is very much promoting a new uh, uh, security and defense doctrine. It's a major shift um, that we are witnessing with the release of the new security uh, strategy. And, and in this context, uh, even if there are still general declaration about potential cooperation under the BRI framework, um, I don't think we can uh, go back to a form of cooperation that we had been witnessing um, under Abe, just because uh, competition between uh, security alliances and partnership is very strong now and is infusing on the potential economic cooperation and, and their limits. Um, I just want to uh, close with uh, by underlining that uh, at a time when uh, when in the US, uh, many European countries, uh, Japan, uh, Australia, Canada, and other allies are uh, really strengthening uh, the alliance and uh, security cooperation uh, at various level. Uh, on its side, China uh, is also very active in trying to uh, promote a, a form of uh, 
partnership, but it's a network of what it is being called friends, not allies. There is no uh, alliance treaty to be signed anytime soon, but at the UN, China is managing uh, on occasion to gather significant countries around its position, including on Xinjiang at the Human Rights Council. As you may have seen uh, three months ago, China managed to gather a majority of country so that a debate on uh, Xinjiang would not take place. So in this context, I really think that the competition the rivalry that we have been witnessing between the US and China is not just a rivalry between two countries, but we are increasingly witnessing a rivalry between group of countries. And this rivalry is structured according to different shape, but the um, I really believe that it is an open uh, competition and rivalry because you have a significant number of countries on both sides, and you also see this division on the issue of uh, of the war in Ukraine to some extent. But I will stop here to leave enough time to, for discussion. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alice, for sharing uh, with us these uh, these comments and. And also, uh, I believe that most of these comments are also questions for the other panelists. And if I may start with uh, Takahara-san, uh, the, the question which I, I was also having in mind, and Alice uh, has the same uh, the same concern about the uh, uh, feasibility for Japan to be uh, at the same time promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific and be a part of this constellation uh, within the uh, Belt and Road Initiative that you have mentioned. So uh, how, how do you evaluate the feasibility of this uh, double pass for Japan and, and how to uh, justify it uh, to the Japanese public opinion? Because you have mentioned at the beginning of uh, your presentation uh, the, uh, the, the problem of uh, perception of China in Japan and among the Japanese society. So how can the Japanese authorities in, in the future uh, make some adjustments uh, in order to, you know, establish this sort of a double pass. I think um, I've proven myself right. You know, it's increasingly difficult. Uh, that's what I said, that to implement what I call the two-pronged approach towards China, that is competing and cooperating at the same time. But this is not only what we do, it's what the Chinese are doing. So we are sort of, you know, doing the same thing on, you know, uh, the two sides are doing the same thing, competing and cooperating at, at the same time. I think, uh, you know, Japan is dubbed as an advanced country in meeting new challenges, like the aging society, uh, like environmental protection, what have you. And uh, meeting the challenge of a rising China has, has been one of them. So we have had experience in uh, dealing with this contradiction uh, in a dilemma, as it were. You know, it's, it's a China dilemma, really, because uh, we need cooperation with China on the one hand. Uh, it's unthinkable to sever all the economic ties that we have with China tomorrow or next year or 10 years from, from now. Uh, and we benefit actually from the deepening uh, economic cooperation. And therefore, as I said at the outset, 70%, over 70% of the Japanese find Japan-China relations important. Well, not only because of the economic cooperation side of things, but you know, uh, China is our big neighbor. So also in terms of security, also we should have a stable relationship. Uh, that's, that's a basic point. Um, and uh, But as I said, and as I think uh, uh, Dr. Ekman just proved, uh, the security experts will focus on the security side of things and, and they, they are right. But when we focus on the, the business side of things, they are also right. So how, how do we live with this contradiction? Uh, that's, that's the challenge that we are all facing. Uh, that's what I was trying to say. Even the, Chi the Chinese fully understand the difference between the Japanese version of FOIP and the American version of FOIP. I mean, the FOIP itself is the same. Uh, as I said, there are two aspects, but the emphasis has been different from the outset. You know, when the Japanese um, first came up with this idea of a free and open in the Pacific, it was all uh, that the talk was all about economic cooperation and things like, um, uh, uh, you know, the freedom in of navigation and rule of law, that kind of thing. The, but of course, we know that there's another aspect of, uh, of security 
Uh, and the Americans, when they took up this concept, they oh, they focused mainly on the strategic side of things. So when the Chinese criticized Hoyt, uh, please be careful and, and notice this uh, distinction. The Chinese always criticize the American version of the free and Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, it's written so, for example, in the joint statement issued by Xi Jinping and Putin uh, on the 4th of February uh, last, last year. Uh, it's the American version of the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy that the Chinese criticize. So they are leaving room uh, for a possible cooperation, which I agree that is increasingly difficult uh, uh, under the current um, uh, intensified uh, security uh, competition that we are all familiar uh, with. Uh, but we should not lose hope because as I re would repeat uh, this line that, um, especially for Japan perhaps, because we are a neighbor of China, uh, we therefore feel a lot of pressure uh, before the Americans started fussing about uh, uh, you know, Chinese military uh, build up and you know their challenge, we we were the first one to to say this is an important issue. You know, it's not only the problem is not a bilateral issue between Japan and China, but this is going to be a global issue because it's about principles. Uh, you know, you have to. Uh, abide by the UN Charter and solve all the international problems through peaceful means. But the Chinese are ch trying to change the status quo by physical force, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's what we started to say. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, we have to coexist with China. That's the reality. Uh, so it's a very contradictory reality. But the Europeans, especially the French, I think, can understand this uh, because the world is not black or white. The world is not Hollywood. <laughs> uh, and and therefore, uh, Japan-China relations, for example, has had both the resilient aspect and the fragile aspect for many years, especially uh, since the fishing trawler incident happened in two thousand in uh, twenty ten. Uh, but we we've been trying to uh, live through this contradiction, live with this contradiction, and 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 survive and prosper that's my reaction thank you thank you very much i i, I believe that uh, from a french perspective we we understand what you mean by coexistence and this importance of uh, uh, coexistence um when it comes to the uh, the different aspects of this relation and how to solve the problem we we have identified uh, the economic factors and and it seems uh san that uh, according to your perspective this is uh, somewhere where we can build on uh, some sort of confidence between the two countries based on this uh, interdependency. Uh, we have also mentioned, and, and Alice uh, has uh, uh, made some comments on that, the, the security uh, factor and the, uh, the security perception on both sides, which makes it very difficult for both countries to uh, coexist. And, and Emmanuel earlier also mentioned the uh, historical aspects. Uh, which is also another problem. And, and that brings me one, uh, one short comment about uh, another example in, in your region, uh, Takahara-san, which might be quite interesting in order to uh, establish some sort of you know, possibilities uh, to explore when it comes to this uh, coexistence, is the relation between uh, Japan and South Korea. Uh, there is uh, some sort of economic interdependency. There's no particular security problem, uh, at least not at the same scale than what we uh, observe with North Korea uh, in particular. But yet, there is a problem when it comes to the perception, uh, especially in South Korea, the, the, the negative perception of, of Japan in South Korea, based, of course, on the uh, legacy of uh, World War II, uh, the, the comfort women, and, and all this part of uh, history. So uh, uh, what we see here is perhaps the fact that even when we discuss uh, the um, economic relations based on common pragmatism, even when we start having a comprehensive dialogue on security in order to understand what are each other's uh, aims and also fears, there are still some problems as regards the perceptions, the deep uh, perceptions. And, and I, I, I'm asking now this question to, to Emmanuel, when it comes to how can we solve these historical problems, how can we include the memory factor in the dialogue between uh, Japan and China? 
Well, uh, to react, I would say, and I do share the opinion of Alice, I'm not really sure that uh, the nomination of Zhao Litian and even uh, the nomination of Ting Gong as the new uh, Chinese Minister of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs is a good sign of appeasement mm -hmm. because they do belong to this uh, wolf warriors generation of dipl diplomats. So I'm not sure that it's a good sign also for the relationships of uh, Japan and, and China. Well, uh, the basic answer to, to your question would be to, to find uh, a third actor uh, between, uh, in between <laughs> China and Japan. And who knows, uh, an actor uh, uh, who doesn't belong to, to that uh, area, such as France, <laughs> why not? For example. Which has uh, a, a, a big historical background um, based on uh, a successful uh, reconciliation policy with Germany. So I think, uh, well, when there is a conflict between two individuals, or two states, the solution is to find a third actor. So it could be the role of France, who knows. And I, and I believe this is one of the uh, aiming of this, uh, this meeting today. So thank you. Thank you for sharing this comment with us. Uh, perhaps I have a question now for, uh, for uh, Camille in particular. When it comes to uh, the South China Sea uh, problem, and, and I, I read the question that I received from one of our participants, in what way can France and Japan influence the power play in the South China Sea? And second question, what are the priorities of both countries in this region? Okay, so for the South China Sea, I think that the difficulty here is that although China believes that, believes that Japan is an important player in this region, I think that China does not believe that France is an important player in this region. Um, and the different uh, things that China has said following the AUKUS uh, thing, so when um, the Americans decided to take on uh, submarine contracts from the French on for Australia, uh, China never even mentioned France ever in the four months that followed. So I think that this shows that actually it didn't even take that opportunity to make wolf warrior comments about the United States being a bad ally. So I think that for China, actually France is a non-actor in the Indo-Pacific and in the South China Sea. So I think that the, the thing is that I, I do not really believe that France could be a broker, for instance, uh, in, in the region, just because China doesn't think it's an important actor in the region. Um, well, Alice, you are a member of the uh, EU ISS, and, and I have several questions as regard the uh, EU policy and the EU relation uh, with, uh, with Japan. So do you have some comments about like what, what is the uh, uh, current partnership uh, between uh, the EU and uh, Japan when it comes not to the economic aspect? So we're not talking about trade issues here, but we're talking about political aspects and do we have some shared vision and what is the level of the partnership? So perhaps as a reminder for uh, all our participants, like, like what is the exact state of the, the uh, uh, cooperation between the EU and Japan? Mm. I'm not an EU diplomat, so I won't necessarily <laughs> share the uh, official line here, but as an analyst uh, working on uh, EU-related issues, yeah, I, ca I can uh, share some points. First of all, obviously, uh, you have natural uh, room for cooperation between the EU and Japan, given that both have uh, endorsed uh, Indo-Pacific strategies. Uh, Japan earlier on and uh, and uh, the EU more recently, but it's a, it's an important uh, development. And we have been witnessing uh, several uh, high level uh, visits and exchanges between the EU and Japan in recent months, and we will also witness more in the coming weeks in a very short term. Um, on uh, in May 
2022, uh, Charles Michel, uh, the European Council president, said that the closing and press conference closing the 28th uh, EU Japan summit, he, he said that Japan is the uh, EU's closest strategic partner in the Indo Pacific region. <laughs> so that, that's really underlined how, you know, how strong is. Uh, is seen the, the the partnership from uh, from EU institution. Um, in more concrete terms, as you know, both con both not countries, but EU and Japan have signed a connectivity agreement uh, four years ago, uh, and and that's really a, a, an area of uh, of cooperation. So jointly developing uh, infrastructure projects, uh, not just in respective market, but also in third countries, and I would say more and more in in the coming. Uh, Years digital uh, cooperation uh, will be key in the framework of this partnership. Um, now, I think there is a yeah, there is a, there's a room for discussion and cooperation following also interpretation of the new security strategies. What does it mean? Uh, what are the the consequences also for EU uh, Japan cooperation? But in also in more concrete term, and uh, both uh, Brussels and Tokyo are on the same line regarding uh, Ukraine. And that's a very important point from a, a new perspective, of course. Um, so I think in the in the coming uh, weeks also, it will be interesting to hear the Japanese side about what they can do, what they will they may do more towards not just the positioning but also support towards uh, towards Ukraine. But I would say, you know, this uh, value based cooperation, the fact that both countries share the same uh, same line on Ukraine, but also on on. Uh, Taiwan concern about uh, Taiwan and escalation of Taiwan in, of tension in the in the Strait is an important point, um, but uh, of course you know you have different geographic uh, position and different uh, I would say um, approach toward China uh, that are partly due to uh, you know also different priorities. I think uh, at the core of EU uh, Japan uh, exchanges also will be the uh, question of uh, Ukraine, and I believe Japan would like to to bring more China discussion in the dialogue but in concrete term uh, it will be more about digital uh, connectivity in the future i believe mm -hmm. thank you thank you alice you have mentioned taiwan actually in your, in your answer and i do have several questions uh when it comes to uh, to taiwan so perhaps i we can have a little round table about this issue on taiwan because it seems that uh, most of you will have some uh, some uh, answers so uh well first of all when it comes to uh, to you uh, uh, professor takahara um, the question is, uh, how important is the preservation of Taiwan's autonomy in Japan's current security and defense strategy? And, and then I will ask uh, uh, the other panelists to give some comments about uh, the importance of Taiwan in this uh, relation uh, and perhaps the deterioration of the relation between uh, Japan and China. Takahara-san. Well, um, first of all, not only Taiwan, but um, those uh, East and South China Sea issues um, they, I think, are very important, not only to Japan, but also to the European nations, too, because it's a matter of principle. You know, Ukraine is also, uh, you know, there's not only real war, but also it's a question of um, principles that rule the order of the world. And that's why the Japanese have been cooperating uh, in the uh, EU crisis with like-minded nations. We impose sanctions on, on Russia. We provide non-combatant, um, uh, you know, um, uh, e equipment uh, to U Ukraine because we feel that we, we should cooperate uh, because there's something that we really find important to, to protect and, and defend. Uh, so I, I think uh, when something similar happens, uh, in our part of the world, I really expect and hope uh, that uh, the European friends will do, do the same uh, because I, I believe that we are um, trying to defend um, the same things. Uh, that, that's the basic point. And, and Taiwan, of course, is so important, um, not in, only in terms of um, the political systems that they enjoy and the values that they represent and um, they embody. Uh, but also, you know, of, of course, it depends on how things happen when we think about the concrete uh, process of uh, possible uh, changes. Uh, if, if it's the Taiwanese people's wish to 
uh, unify that that's that's their decision but uh, otherwise you know that's very unlikely and therefore uh, if we are talking about some um, coercion uh, some military actual hostilities uh, then then that's going to be an extremely serious um, uh, blow uh, to uh, the economy and um, the actually it will involve the, the lives of people um not only the taiwanese and the mainland uh chinese but also people there are a lot of foreigners living there <laughs> uh, so uh it, it's an extremely important uh question well, i think that the unification based on uh, the will of the taiwanese is very unlikely <laughs> at the moment and, and will remain a uh, uh, very unlikely, I believe. Uh, Camille, would you like to add something about the importance of Taiwan in this uh, relation and how it does affect the relation between uh, uh, Tokyo and, and Beijing in particular? Yeah, I think that the, the thing is that the commentators have really focused on the idea of a Chinese invasion uh, of Taiwan, our outright invasion. But I think that in the the near future, at least, it's going to be below the threshold of war, so below uh, the, the very invasion stage, just because, for instance, the American uh, Defense Department says that China does not have the MPB uh, abilities to, to carry out uh, a full invasion, and so probably uh, until the end of the decade, it's probably going to be below the threshold. So it's going to be uh, economic difficulties. It's also going to be military drills next to Taiwan, probably at most an invasion of the islands next to Taiwan, but probably not a full right invasion of Taiwan. And I think that there is actually little discussion of what to do, how to react uh, within uh, the framework, but below the threshold of war. And I think that's probably uh, something to be discussing uh, between uh, France and Japan, what to do, how to react uh, in the scenarios that are most likely. Emmanuel, what's your comment on uh, the Taiwan issue? Well, I think Japanese are uh, historically concerned because it is an ex-colony of Japan. So it's like uh, uh, the French, uh, if you ask them what about uh, North of Africa or Tunisia, they are at the same time concerned also. But uh, the core of the problem is uh, the question of uh, the freedom of navigation, of course. So. Uh, Taiwan is just at the middle of the China Sea, so uh, uh, of course for the, the Japanese, uh, so the question of uh, the independence of Taiwan is very important as a respect of uh, the navigation of freedom. And um, I think everything is moving now on a geopolitical point of view. I wouldn't be surprised uh, that Japan at the same time uh, should be more concerned about the north territories of Siberia and Kuril and Sakhalin, maybe, because uh, Russia becomes more and more uh, uh, weak, as you know, and uh, I think everything is moving even if it's area. All the ghosts of history are uh, coming back in a certain way. So we, we need also to, to keep in mind that uh, the question of the representations and the question of memories are very important because they move all of us and they move all the people in the area. And, and at least to, uh, to close up this uh, round table on, on Taiwan, we, we know not only that uh, the, the polls has regard the possible unification of very negative in Taiwan, and, and the vast majority of the population rejects uh, any uh, idea of unification. But we know at the same time that the perception of Japan is, is extremely good uh, in Taiwan, which is actually uh, uh, perhaps the, the only country in the region that shows uh, such numbers. So um, how, how can Japan uh, play a significant role in uh, both appeasing and perhaps at the same time uh, making uh, the relation more difficult between Taiwan and China. What, what is the position of, uh, of Japan in the future? Well, uh, we find Taiwan a very precious 
neighbor in many ways. As you mentioned, um, the emotional ties are very solid. Um, you know, we both experience very bad earthquakes, for example, and we send, um, you know, things uh, to the other side when those things happen. Um, uh, and we sort of uh, fully ap appreciate their um, post-World War II efforts in economic development and political development. I think they've been a very successful case um, and uh, we hope that they'll be able to uh, preserve uh, what they have achieved. Um, but we have to find a very appropriate way to support them uh, because emotionally uh, we, we have this full willingness to support them. But if we overdo it, uh, it could backfire um, you know, because of the sensitivity of the issue to the mainlanders. Uh, for example, if a very high-ranking political figure visits uh, Taiwan, um, the Taiwanese will have mixed feelings about that. They they are happy about uh, moral support, uh, but you know, to be realistic, is that really going to help our security? That's the question that they will ask them themselves, and the answer is not necessarily yes. Uh, so it's a very delicate. Um, question and uh, we have to find a wise way to uh, support uh, the Taiwanese. So Ali, Ali, sorry, I give you the floor. To... Uh, no, it's fine. Just to, to complement, it's interesting to note that uh, Prime Minister Kishida has been linking the situation in Ukraine with the one in, uh, in Taiwan, uh, considering that what is happening in Europe could happen in East Asia especially recently, and, and he used that argument partly to justify the increase in defense budget and also uh, Japan's overall uh, security um, positioning. Um, personally, uh, I, I believe the, the parallel uh, should not be overdeveloped. I don't think China needs, uh, needs Russia to know what you know, to, to, to define a strategy and find a strategy toward Taiwan. Uh, I don't think that, uh, and like, like I mean, I don't think that we should expect a full-fledged, uh, uh, I would say, traditional invasion of uh, China towards Taiwan. I think it's important to consider this option, especially as Xi Jinping mentioned that the uh, military option is on the table. But when you read very closely the opening speech of the 20th Party Congress, it is really promoting a targeted approach, uh, basically uh, underlining that he aims at, at, I mean, the CPC aims at uh, supporting what he calls uh, patriots and uh, targeting what he called uh, separatists. <laughs> so uh, you have a different approach, uh, different tools to, to, to promote this differentiated strategy, uh, cyber uh, support or disinformation and attack. You also have economic leverage or sanction. You also have uh, lawfare um, that I often mention. I know the situation is very different in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, law has been used to promote uh, uh, you know, um, Beijing uh, political strategy of uh, harmonization, I would say, of, of the Hong Kong territory with, with the adoption of the um, national uh, um, of the of the of, of the July 2020 uh, uh, law, but a uh, similar law could not be adopted towards Taiwan, obviously, given the difference in context, but law could be used by Beijing uh, towards some Taiwan institutions or citizens. It has done so in the past, and it could also enlarge a blacklist of uh, citizens and uh, institutions from Taiwan who are seen as secessionists and then who should be target of uh, through various channels. So I won't, I won't develop too much on that, but Question: I wonder if at some point the war in Ukraine is not used in a case, or is is not, um, how to say, uh, too much discussed to basically justify uh, the new security de development in Japan. I'm not saying that the, this is a you know it, it's uh, it's direct, but I, I I'm not very comfortable when Prime Minister Kishida make a direct link between Ukraine and Taiwan. I think it's a bit simplistic. It's a bit too far fetched, and uh, I, I would be more I'm from an ethical level. I would be uh, more nuanced and and saying, OK, let's look at the new security strategy of Japan, uh, uh, considering it's a, it's a long-term uh, 
development that is coming out now. Um, would it have come out without the war in Ukraine? Uh, or would it come out more easily? It's for sure we are seeing an uh, increase in defense budgets from all parts of the world, also an arm race and reinforcement of security cooperation across the world. But uh, to what extent we should roll parallel as such, uh, um, I'm not comfortable with it uh, from my perspective. Thank you. Uh, well, well, perhaps, uh, uh, Takahara-san, you, you will answer uh, actually the uh, uh, reception of uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, new approach of uh, security in Japan made by uh, the, the Kishida cabinet and, and the use of the Ukrainian war and if, if it is uh, accepted by the uh, Japanese population. But I, I do have a, actually a specific question for, for you and Camille Brugier, uh, which is a more strategic uh, question. So I, I read it. As far as the Chinese missile threat against Japan is concerned, there is a discussion in Japan whether the response should be a preemptive strike or a counter strike against the Chinese missile launching sites. At which point are presently the discussions in Japan about that? So, uh, Professor Takahara, maybe if you can uh, give us some comments about you know how how to uh, um, how to prevent uh, what is uh, potentially a, a threat coming from uh, from the uh, missiles uh, in uh, in China, and perhaps Kami will say some comments about it too. Um, first of all, uh, where shall I start? Um, mm, on the Ukraine uh, question, um, the invasion by Putin did um, have a big impact on how the Japanese public uh, viewed uh, security issues. So I think Kishida's remarks were you know, trying to make use of uh, this big shock that uh, hit the Japanese uh, people in order to justify the the new um, security documents that he was going to release. Uh, that was his political in intention, as as I think you understand, and I think you mentioned. Um, uh, that's 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 that. Uh, I don't think the professionals think that you know uh, the situations uh, in the Ukraine and Taiwan are very similar. And I would agree with you that uh, uh, many Japanese actually experts don't think um, that the Chinese side will attack uh, Taiwan uh, in the near future. But at the same time, we all understand that we should not lower our guards any time. Uh, anything could happen. So we should be prepared and we should be prepared better for uh, the gray zone um, incidents and things that uh, Camille mentioned. Uh, so we haven't been doing our homework very well up to this moment. So I, I think from now on, the pace will be quickened uh, to prepare ourselves for all sorts of um, contingencies. And um, uh sorry what was the latter question uh on um the, the other question was about the uh the um uh, missiles uh, in uh, the missiles yes the uh, uh the preemptive missile or counter uh counter, attack. Counter. I, yeah i'm not a security expert so uh it it would be difficult for me to uh, give you the situation of the arguments or the discussions um uh, that's taking place uh, amongst the uh, real experts here in, in Tokyo. But um, our constitution, uh, unless our constitution is changed, I think it will be very difficult to embark on a preemptive uh, attack uh, against any foreign country. Yeah, me if you want to add something. Yeah, this yeah. Question. Apart from the fact that, yeah, technically uh, there is a legal problem for Japan to do something like that, I think that the preemptive strike is always a bad idea. Uh, in this context, uh, it would mean going to war with China, which is not necessarily something that Japan wants at all, and something that it wants at all in like the near or the far future, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what you just uh, said. Uh, perhaps now a question uh, specifically for Emmanuel and Alice. Uh, both of you have uh, mentioned uh, Emmanuel Macron's visit uh, to, to China. And actually, if I'm correct, it, 
it will be his first trip since uh, uh, 2019 or 2018, uh, only his third trip uh, since he was elected uh, in, in 2017. Um, and uh, uh, what, what are the expectations for Emmanuel Macron during this trip? Uh, and what could be the results, uh, Emmanuel first? Well, I think it's a, it's a very delicate issue because, um, uh, as we know, China is uh, in a deep crisis uh, today. Uh, we don't know about the future, the future of Xi Jinping as well. Uh, so I'm not sure that uh, it is the appropriate time for going to China, even though uh, the relationship between the two countries is very important in the order, uh, especially to prepare the anniversary of uh, the recognition by de Gaulle next year in 2024, which is very important, uh, especially for the Chinese, because uh, traditionally, uh, the Chinese diplomacy uh, has always uh, tried to find a, a way to uh, to establish um, a special relationship with uh, with France. Uh, paradoxically, in the end, to speak with the Americans. So I, I think uh, this trip uh, for Emmanuel Macron will be more important for Xi Jinping than for Emmanuel Macron. <laughs> Uh, it will be delicate also for Emmanuel Macron for political issues also, uh, for political reasons, uh, I would say, uh, because uh, as we said before, the image of China is very negative now in the opinion. Uh, so going into China today or even in April is quite difficult. Uh, and uh, of course, he will certainly sign big contracts for Safran, for Airbus, and so on. But uh, it is especially for Xi Jinping um, a very important issue. Alice, would you agree with what Emmanuel has said? It's very hard to comment on this visit, which has just been announced. And as you know, April is quite far away, and many things can change since then. Uh, on the at the COVID level, at the bilateral level, at the European level. A question that is interesting to follow is to what extent uh, Euro Emmanuel Macron really Europeanized the visit. If you remember well, in his uh, 2019 visit, he, he went to uh, to China uh, with a, a German minister and a European commissioner, uh, Phil Hogan. Um, and, and, and that was part of a, a methodological approach to, you know, to, to try to, uh, to, to gain leverage in front of China by, by playing uh, the European card. And, and there's a French presidency that has uh, ended last year. Uh, you really, there was really a push from, from, from France to to talk about the Indo-Pacific, about China at European level, and I think that uh, that uh, that was quite influential. So uh, it's very interesting to see how uh, the Elysee will prepare uh, the visit in cooperation with the European partners and how concrete term uh, you know the, the visit will take place, uh, which type of delegation, uh, how European it will be, and uh, I agree that it will be a very difficult visit. <laughs> Um, because of political tensions, uh, because of uh, of um, of say of the difficulty to separate the economic cooperation from uh, from this political tension. Uh, I don't really, I really don't believe that uh, that that you you can separate the different type of uh, the relationship now. So, and even talking about areas of cooperation such as. Uh, climate change, uh, it's becoming more difficult than before uh, for various reasons that uh, that is related to the intertwining of uh, of the areas of uh, bilateral cooperation. So to be followed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have only about five minutes remaining. So what I propose now is to have a last round table. I have several questions uh, that could be like combined together regarding both uh, the perception uh, among the Japanese population of the uh, uh, current adjustments in the defense policy, like how, what is the uh, reception? I mean, we remember, for instance, uh, back in, in 
in 2015, uh, the protests uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, reform of the uh, Article 9 of the, the Constitution. So are we facing the, 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 the same sort of uh, uh, attitude among the, uh, the Japanese public opinion? And uh, the other question, which is perhaps more for our French panelists here, is about uh, the uh, relation with the United States, but that also concerns uh, Japan. So uh, we are uh, both here allies of the United States, but the question is, our uh, strategic autonomy uh, in the region should be uh, increase our autonomy, or should be uh, should we be uh, at the uh, uh, on the other side stand with the United States and perhaps uh, uh, um, uh, like emphasize on the ideological problems with China and the ideological uh, uh, divergences? So, uh, what should be our attitude as regards the relation with the United States in dealing? with uh, China and in dealing with uh, our own interests in the region. So Japan's public opinion and our relations with the United States. Professor Takahara. Well, um, policies have been churned out so quickly, so fast. And my impression is that uh, the public has not caught up uh, with the new uh, documents and policies. Uh, and therefore, you know, the, the debates in the Diet, our parliament, is just to begin. Uh, so there'll be a lot of um, uh, intensive discussions uh, from now on. Uh, that's the current situation. And um, our relations with the U.S. Uh, has to be a close one. Uh, our security ties has to be reinforced uh, in order to meet the challenges. I think that's, um, uh, you know, we have to accept that. Um, but at the same time, um, we should be uh, good partners in the sense that uh, we have to be frank about uh, the exchange of views. Uh, and of course, the views may not always be the same. Uh, so we expect the United States to be, um, you know, uh, a good listener. Uh, in listening to um, different views, if there are any different views uh, amongst their uh, security pa partners. Thank you. Can we yes. uh, I don't think that uh, strategic autonomy is in opposition to being a, a good ally to the United States. I do actually think that if uh, the European Union or European states had more strategic autonomy, it would actually help uh, the United States uh, as our ally, because we would better be able to defend the European continent. Uh, in terms of Asia, I do think that so far, the, the opinions about China as a threat are diverging uh, from one when you call the United States and the EU. And I do think that it's really important for European member states to keep in mind that in terms of the Indo-Pacific and Asia in general, our interests are, are divergent from those of the United States. So I would call for a more strategic autonomy while keeping, of course, uh, the United States as a very close ally. I do share uh, Kevin's opinion. I think we need to find a third path um, in between the US and China. And I think Japan could be a very good uh, uh, partner in that way. Uh, I think um, the acceptation of uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, project as the Americans uh, usually think which means confront, confrontation against China uh, mustn't be uh, our way, of course. And uh, because of uh, uh, its uh, overseas interests, France could speak also in the name of all the countries of Europe and uh, establish a better and closer relationship with Japan in that framework too. Alice, you have the last word. No, we, we cannot hear you. We can't hear. <laughs> I was saying um, not much to add. I, I believe really that um, it's not an easy, I would say, era that we are entering with a comparing uh, partnership and um, 
just to go back to what uh, Professor Takahara said, that the, the world is not black and white. I fully agree with you, but it, it's it's kind of becoming progressively black and white, uh, black or white. So it's difficult to uh, to maintain. Uh, to, I mean, at the same time, there is strength to diversify partnerships. But at the same time, diversification of partnership is, is kind of following uh, geop geopolitical compatibilities that is also uh, influencing uh, economic cooperation to a great extent. So uh, I, I, I believe it's uh, it's important to continue to follow uh, France-Japan relationship, EU-Japan relationship, as well as relationship with other partners. Um, but uh, diverging um, interaction with, with China and position on China may also create tension among allies. And uh, and China is also very, I would say, um, clever in proposing uh, its initiative to diversity of country, including to uh, to U.S. allies, and that has in the past creating uh, uh, divergences and and tension. I'm thinking about the AIB, for instance. I'm thinking about Belt and Road uh, MOU that has been signed with Italy in 2019, for instance. And I may think about other type of cooperation in the field of connectivity that may emerge in the coming years that may be hard to, I would say, handle and manage uh, within the Indo-Pacific grouping. Well, it has been over 90 minutes already. Uh, so unfortunately, we have to end here. I I'm sorry uh, for the questions that we were not able to answer because uh, there, there were many questions and some of them a little bit longer than others. So I tried to combine all of them together. But again, sorry for all the uh, participants who feel perhaps a little bit frustrated because we couldn't address exactly uh, your questions. Uh, however, I remind you that this seminar has been recorded and it will be put online within two weeks and shared with all the uh, social networks where you can find uh, Iris. So um, uh, do not hesitate to watch this, uh, this seminar again and to, and to spread it uh, around you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, today. Uh, Professor Takahara, uh, thank you for staying with us uh, in the evening and, and we wish you a, a very pleasant evening in Tokyo. Thank you uh, to our French panelists, uh, Camille and Emmanuel here and Alice online for uh, taking some, some time and, and sharing uh, your vision on, on this uh, extremely important topic. We do believe that uh, we will have um, several uh, topics to discuss when it comes to uh, both the economic partnership, the strategic partnership, the uh, historical aspects. I mean, these are all different topics that we have to explore in more details and that will be probably subject to uh, several meetings in the future. So again, thank you very much. We had an average of about 140 participants uh, overall, a little bit less now, obviously, but we had a peak of uh, 162 uh, participants to this panel. So I, I, I think it was a, a success. Uh, so thank you so much and thank you for attending this seminar today. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Arigato. Arigato gozaimasu.